you. Good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Well, I want to tell you that orange is in for the next couple of weeks, so get your orange on. Did you get your prayer bracelet on the way in? Uh, you got your orange bracelet rocking, and you know, anything you can do, just wear orange for the, wear, wear some orange for the next couple of weeks. And as we launch this jump in campaign, I want to say from the outset that this is about so much more than a new building. I happen to like buildings, and I want you to know that our new church is going to be awesome, and I think it should be to the glory of God, but I want you to know that this whole thing is about much more than a new building. This is about God's mission on the earth. All of scripture really is God inviting one person after another to jump into his mission. God spoke to Abram, an idol worshiper in Ur of the Chaldees, and he invited Abraham, Abraham to jump into his mission. He invited Rebekah to jump into the mission. He invited Jacob and Joseph through dreams to jump into the mission. He spoke to Moses out of a burning bush, and he invited him to jump into the mission. He found Gideon hiding in the bottom of a wine press, and he invited him to jump into the mission. He sent Samuel to Jesse's house, and he invited David to jump into the mission. He invited Esther and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. He sent the angel Gabriel to a virgin named Mary, and he invited her to jump into the mission. And what is God's mission? Jesus told us in Luke chapter 4 at the beginning of his ministry, and I want to read those words quickly. Luke chapter 4 and beginning in verse 14, listen to what Jesus says about God's mission. It says in Luke 4, 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole country. He taught in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it he found the place where it is written the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When Jesus was done reading, he rolled up the scroll and he handed it back to the attendant and he sat down in the preaching chair and everyone looked at him and he opened his mouth and he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What is God's mission? God's mission is to broadcast a message of good news that brings an instant reward. Jesus' public ministry is starting here in the synagogue in his hometown. This was Jesus' home church if you will. He went to the Saturday school there. He learned the Hebrew uh, language there. He learned the Torah there. He was bar mitzvah there. And now as a grown man, Jesus came back from the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. In the liturgy of the synagogue, he was handed the scroll of Isaiah and he chose Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. You know that original word there is the word euangelion. We get our word the gospel from that Greek word. We also get our word evangelize from that. And originally the euangelion was the reward money that was paid to a messenger who reached the king with good news. If there was a decisive battle that was won in a far off country, the first runner to arrive with the good news that the army had been victorious would receive from the king an euangelion, a handsome reward. You know, I like that. God's mission on earth is to broadcast everywhere a message of good news that has a handsome reward attached to it. Beloved, I want to tell you, the gospel is not just a religious teaching. It's not just a philosophy. It's not just a set of moral ideals. This gospel is a divine message that brings immediate and dramatic rewards. 
It changes forever the fortunes of those who receive it. It enriches the lives of those who receive it. It brings great joy to the hearts of those who receive it. What is God's mission? God's mission is to relieve the poor. Jesus said that this message was for the poor. You know, that certainly might include people who are in financial need, but Jesus has something more than economics in mind. The poor are people who have fallen behind in the game of life. They're people who have been unlucky in love, the lonely, the loveless, people who loved once and then lost. The poor are people who have been unwanted or unwelcomed by others, people who have been neglected or rejected. The poor are people who are plagued by deep-seated insecurities, people who dislike themselves, people who are driven by the need to gain acceptance. Zacchaeus was such a man, although he was powerful and wealthy, he was driven by a need for acceptance. Can I tell you that Greenwich is a town that is full of poor people? The poor are people with shattered dreams. People who are disenchanted with life, who are discontent, who are discouraged. Some of them are just plain bored. The poverty that Jesus is talking about is the kind that cuts across all economic strata. It cuts across all social classes. It affects men and women, young and old, educated and illiterate, the prominent and peasants alike. The poor are down and outers and up and outers. And only the message of Jesus can relieve this kind of poverty. Only the message of Jesus can change the fortunes and enrich the lives of these kind of poor. What is God's mission? God's mission is to release the captives. This kind of captive is someone who is imprisoned by invisible forces. Captives are people who are held in the grips of generational sins and sicknesses. Mental and emotional disorders that have come down family lines, physical diseases that have come down family lines, economic curses that have come down family lines, patterns of self-destructive behaviors that have come down family lines, generational prejudice and hatred, anger, abuse, addictions. Captives are people who long for a lasting change in their life, but at best their journey through life is just trading one dependency for the next. This kind of captivity sentences men and women to an entire lifetime in prison, and then it ends in a death sentence. Only Jesus can set those kind of captives free. Malcolm Muggeridge said, all other freedoms once won soon turn into a new servitude. Christ is the only liberator whose liberation lasts forever. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. What is God's mission? God's mission is to restore the sight to the blind. This kind of blindness is the kind that occurs with one's eyes wide open. Unlike physical blindness, the real tragedy of spiritual blindness is that those who are blind don't even know that they are. Blindness is the ability to see everything except what's most important in life. Blindness is the ability to master every kind of academic discipline and yet be totally ignorant of eternal realities. Blindness is the, is the inability to perceive the spiritual world, to grasp spiritual truths. It's the inability to perceive the existence and the presence of God. Blindness is the ability to make amazing human achievements and yet to be unable to solve the most fundamental perennial problems of mankind. It's to stumble through life, unable to find that path that leads to fulfillment and joy and health and peace and prosperity. Only Jesus can restore spiritual sight and wisdom to people who are plagued with this kind of blindness. The wicked grope around in deep darkness, the Bible says. They don't even know what makes them stumble. But the path of the righteous is like the first light of dawn that keeps getting brighter and brighter until the full light of day. What is God's mission? God's mission is to rescue the bruised. 
Jesus came for people who have been dumped on in life, for people who have been beaten up by life. The bruised are the abused, the violated, the victimized, the neglected, the betrayed, those who have suffered losses. My heart was broken this last week. Maybe you saw in the headlines the story of the little 12-year-old girl from Florida who committed suicide because she was so savagely bullied on the internet. She went to a cement plant and she climbed a tower and she jumped off and she took her own life. Dads and moms, let me tell you something. You need to know what's going on online with your kids. You need to see their texts. You need to read their emails. You need to know what's going on in their social media pages. Listen to me. When they lay their sweet little heads on their pillows, you go through their iPad, their iPod, their iPhone. I want to tell you something, and listen to me. Your parental responsibility before God trumps any right to privacy that they might think that they're entitled to. And your kids won't be damaged in the least if you hold them off from going online for a while. They won't be damaged in the least. It won't uh, arrest their development. It won't ruin their future. And if it becomes a point of contention, just yank the dumb cable right out of your house. Throw away the router. Take that iPhone, pound, pound, pound with a little hammer. I wonder what Rebecca's parents would do differently if they could now. She was bruised, and if only they had known what Jesus can do. That kind of bruising creates a, an oppressive condition in someone's spirit from which he or she must be rescued, and only Jesus can do that. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the price that brings us peace was laid on him on the cross. What is God's mission? God's mission is to offer people grace without judgment. Just as important as the words that Jesus read from Isaiah are the words that Jesus omitted at the end of the verse. He stood up and read from Isaiah 61.1, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the bruised, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus stops speaking, but in Isaiah, the verse goes on. It says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus left those words out. Why? Because he came to offer people grace without judgment. Jesus came to offer people an opportunity for divine amnesty. He came to offer people forgiveness with no consequences, the cancellation of their sin debts with no penalty. He came to offer people emancipation with no reprisals. Jesus came to usher in a season of grace on the earth where the judgment of God is suspended so that people everywhere can hear this good news and receive it. What is God's mission? God's mission is to do everything that Jesus promised today. When he finished reading, he sat down in the preaching chair and he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You see, the Jewish people lived for centuries in the hope that the Messiah would come someday. But Jesus' word is, God has sent me to save you today. Beloved, how many people muddle through life? Surviving on the hope that someday things will get better. Someday my prince will come. <laughs> someday my ship will come in. Someday I'll get my lucky break. Mm, someday, child, things are going to get easier. Someday things will be brighter. But Jesus said, I will relieve your poverty today. I will release you from captivity today. I will restore your sight today. I will rescue you from a bruised spirit today. What is God's mission? 
It's to broadcast everywhere on earth a message of good news that brings an instantaneous and generous reward from heaven. And how does God accomplish this mission? Jesus showed us. God accomplishes this mission through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one whom Isaiah foresaw. He is God's suffering servant. He is the unique son of God, the Jewish Messiah, and the one and only Savior of the world. Jesus is the one who relieves the poor. Jesus is the one who releases the captives, who restores sight to the blind, who rescues the bruised through his substitutionary death on the cross, through the cleansing power of his precious blood, through the indescribable work of the Holy Spirit that comes only through him. How does God accomplish his mission? Through Jesus. And God accomplishes his mission through human messengers anointed for the ministry of preaching. Jesus said today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Beloved, you see, the time of salvation, it comes with the announcement of the good news. Preaching the good news is what releases that now moment of salvation over people. That's why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching to save people's souls. God said through Isaiah, as the heavens soar high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work, like the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return again without watering the earth, so is my word. It will not come back to me empty. It will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. Now faith comes through hearing, and hearing comes through the word of the Lord. And how shall they hear unless someone preaches? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? Every time we gather for worship, every time I stand in this pulpit or Pastor Nick or one of our other pastors or one of our guests, I have to tell you, I expect something to happen because the gospel is that powerful. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to do God's saving work today. How does God accomplish his mission? God accomplishes his mission through local communities of believers gathered in weekly worship services. Beloved, listen to me. There's something important I want you to see in Luke 4. Jesus was in the habit of worshiping at the synagogue every Sabbath day. To, to bring it home, let me put it in our language. I'll say it this way. Jesus had a home church, and he went to church every week. He respected the spiritual discipline of weekly corporate worship. Jesus participated in weekly worship. He sung the hymns. He prayed the prayers. He read the scriptures. He followed the order of service. He submitted to the rules of the house. He respected the authority of the local community of faith and its leaders. Some believers have come to believe that belonging to church isn't very important. They don't see the value of gathering in weekly worship services. They don't want to submit to the authority of a local congregation and its elders and its deacons. They're lone rangers. But you know, Jesus wasn't like that at all. Jesus valued the weekly worship gatherings of local faith communities huge part of his ministry, an integral part of Jesus' ministry, was preaching in the synagogues every week. And beloved, I want to tell you, the weekly worship gatherings of God's people are still integral to the mission. Local churches are still integral to the mission. The weekly fellowship of the believers is still integral to the mission. The worship of the saints, the prayers of the saints, the ministry of the word, it's still integral to the, to the, to the mission. I like what Andy Stanley says. He says, the local church is what God is doing in the world today, and he's so right. And that brings us to jump in. I want to tell you that phase two is integral to the mission. Look around for one moment this morning. 
I have to tell you, there isn't very much room left in this sanctuary for more people to come and join us without being really, really uncomfortable. I mean, you tell the truth. You want an empty seat between you and your neighbor, don't you? <laughs> you just, you want a little, you want a little elbow room. You want a little, look around. There, there's, there's no more room in this service to accommodate any more people that are in this room right now. Phase two is integral to the mission. We've been preparing for the launch of Jump In for several weeks now. And along the way, I started to reminisce about the incredible sacrifices of the congregation over 10 years ago to build phase one. I'm wondering very quickly, how many people were not part of Harvest Time when we built phase one? If you were not in this church when we built this building, would you stand up really quickly all over this place? You're going to be blown away. Look around. How many people were not in this church when we built phase one? That's like, that's like 99% I'm looking at, and it's been like that in every service. Sit down again, if you would, please. For those of you who were not here for the construction of phase one, I want you to know that we're standing on the shoulders of an earlier generation who made great sacrifices to build this church. People offered inheritances that they received to build phase one. People offered bonuses that they received to build phase one. One great story was from a single businesswoman in our congregation. She had a big job with the corporate headquarters of Walden Books. And about the time we launched the capital campaign to build this building, she took a big risk and she left Walden Books and she joined a brand new startup retail venture. She took a huge cut in salary in exchange for stock in the new company and the promise of a quarterly bonus. And being very experienced in retail, she didn't have very high expectations for the startup of, of the first couple of years of this venture. But when we came to our commitment Sunday, she committed that whatever those quarterly bonuses might be, she would give them over the next three years to help us build this building. And you know what God did? He showed up and he did exceedingly abundantly above. Her first quarterly bonus was bigger than her entire year's salary at Walden Books. And for three years, she gave her bonuses to help us build this church. You know, she met her husband here at Harvest Time. And they're married and they're serving the Lord in Florida. And she's on a church staff today. Several young couples brought me money that they had saved for a down payment on a house. One couple brought me a check. It was $50,000, and they said, Pastor Glenn, God told us if we'll help build his house first, then he'll help us build our house. So I want to tell you, I receive a check like that with a shaking hand because it's a sacred gift. People put off retiring and stayed here for five more months to give, five more years to give to phase one. People put off relocating to places with a lower cost of living. People put off replacing their old jalopy and they drove around in their old car for another three or four years. And rather than spending 30 or 40,000 or more on a new car, they chose to give that to our building over the next three years. Can I tell you, none of those people that made those sacrifices are worse off today because they gave to the Lord. People put off remodeling kitchens and bathrooms. People transferred stocks out of their portfolios. People sold real estate and gave the proceeds to build phase one. People brought me checks in the amount of $50,000 who I never would have believed were capable of giving such a generous gift. People sold valuables that they had. And they gave the proceeds to phase one. We had one couple who owned an original Thomas Kincaid painting. And they sold that painting and they brought the proceeds to build phase one. So the painter of light is in here somewhere. <laughs> one of our seniors bought all of the fixtures, the lighting fixtures, on the whole outside of the building, on, all the way down on this side. He said, Pastor, I want to light the way for the next generation coming to Jesus. One of our seniors bought the front doors. You know what? They're home with Jesus now. But I want to tell you, their accounts in heaven are still receiving deposits because of the sacrifices that they made over 10 years ago. Precious people who love Jesus made great sacrifices. But the thought occurred to me, what if they hadn't? What if we hadn't built phase one? 
if we hadn't built phase one in January of 2004 when the town of Greenwich closed the Civic Center, we would have been without a place to meet. And believe me, from 1997 to 1999, we combed this town. We turned over every stone and followed every lead looking for another place to meet, and there was no other place to meet. We hadn't built phase one. Rather than growing to the largest congregation in Greenwich, we probably would have fizzled. In fact, it's very possible that harvest time might not be here at all. You wouldn't be here this morning, and Denise and I would be pastoring First Assembly of God in Dogpatch, Arkansas. So we're very thankful <laughs> that we built phase one. If we hadn't built phase one, the name of Jesus wouldn't have received nearly as much honor in Greenwich as it has received over the last 10 years. Our first ministry is to him. Our first ministry is to give him the glory that's due his name. Our first ministry is to give him thanks. If we hadn't built phase one, over 2,700 worship services in English and in Spanish and now in Portuguese would not have happened over the last 10 years. If we hadn't built phase one, thousands of worship songs would have never been sung. Thousands of prayers would have never been prayed. Thousands of sermons would have never been preached. And a couple of them I wish I could take back, but it's under the blood. <laughs> what about marriages? If we hadn't built phase one, there are some couples who are married today who wouldn't be married today because they met here and they fell in love here and they entered the beautiful covenant of marriage right here. There are some other couples who are still married today who wouldn't still be married. Here's a few of the great phase one romances. Our friends Bob and Karen Coletti, Jimmy and Lachey Fox, David and Ashley Caminiti, Chad and Lindsay Smith, Julio and Emily Rubio, Matthew and Mata Tolentino, Rick and Erica Wiley. They're married today because we built phase one. How about some miracle babies? If we hadn't built phase one, there are some children who are here today who wouldn't be here today. Ethan and Hannah King, the Lord sent in answer to our prayers. Luke Conzo, the Lord sent in answer to our prayers. Little Grace Naylor, the Lord sent in answer to our prayers. The Lord spoke to Shirley in 2000, and, uh, I don't even remember what year, four, when we did 40 days of purpose. Uh, and uh, we prayed, and the Lord sent grace to them. How about launching ministries? If we hadn't built phase one, there are people in ministry today who wouldn't be in ministry today. Our friend Franco Martinez, who graduated from Valley Forge Christian College and is now the youth pastor at Faith Bible Church in Mohegan Lake, New York. I'm so proud of Franco. And listen, you pray for Franco because I'm on a personal mission to find him a wife. So uh, you pray he who finds a wife. David and Ashley Caminiti. David served on our staff here. And now he's studying at Reformed Theological Seminary in Mississippi. Corey Pajoli. Gradu uh, graduated this last year and now he's working for Campus Crusade for Christ in Philadelphia and Corey's about to get married in a couple of weeks. Keith and Danny Phillips graduated from Nyack Christian College. Keith is the director of the IHOP Prayer Room in Cranford, New Jersey and Danny leads Collision, our young adult ministry. Melissa Vogel graduated from Zion Bible College last year and now she's doing a worship internship at Bethel Church in Redding, California. Elizabeth Kelly is studying worship ministry at Nyack Christian College and she's doing an internship here at Harvest Time. Laura Fazio is a senior at Zion Bible College and she's the student body president at Zion and we're so proud of Laura. Sean Sotomayor got zapped by the Holy Spirit in the Tommy Zito revival meetings when he was back he went to the School of Ministry, and now he travels full-time with Tommy Zito. Sharon and German Sotomayor, his parents, got a passion for missions here at Harvest Time, and they're the missions directors at their church today. Pastor Chris and Jeanette Willis served for eight years on our staff, and now they're pastoring in Oxford, Connecticut, and the Lord's giving them great success. Their church has grown so much that they have to go to two Sunday morning worship services now because their building can't hold the congregation in one service. Pastor Danny Vincent was on our staff for two years, and now he's studying at Fuller. Sonia Morris is our walking miracle. 
Sonia had a brain aneurysm and had such extensive damage to her brain that the doctor said she would never walk, she would never talk, she would never function, she would never be awake again. The Lord healed Sonia 100%. She became a lawyer. And then after she became a lawyer, she became a missionary in China, and she just released her first book this year. Michael Morris studied at Alliance Theological Seminary while he was working as a full-time firefighter in New York City. He's a full-time Christian counselor today and leading groups here at Harvest Time. Pastor Dan McCauley served two rounds on our staff and is traveling full-time in worship ministry again. Mary Ann Alexander, certified Christian counselor and does a lot of work for me directly. Lisa Smolowitz, retired from New York City schools this last year. She's now a full-time missionary with Jews for Jesus. Derek Sanchez, who led our Stanford campus, is studying at Alliance. Melissa Pinto, who grew up here at Harvest Time and married her husband James. They're pastoring in Brooklyn, New York. Emily Giancola Littal, who did an internship with us and is now in full-time ministry with her husband. They just got married a couple of weeks ago. Pastor Charles and Rachel Thompson, uh, who graduated this year from Alliance Seminary and are now leading our Stanford campus. We just had our third anniversary celebration dinner for the Stanford campus last night. The room was packed with people. Every time I go, I meet new people who they've won to Christ at the Stanford campus. Christina Abrahams, uh, Edna Lahara, both became Christian counselors this year. Pastor Nick went from practicing law to practicing grace. Pastor Faith went from administration to shepherding. Pastor Karen, Pastor Steve, Pastor Ruth, Pastor Kimmy, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Bobby, they're already rocking it for Jesus and they're going to do even more. And it all happened because we built phase one. Worship team, come and help me. How about missions? If we hadn't built phase one, there are other church buildings all around the world that wouldn't have been built. There are people all around the world who know Jesus today who wouldn't know him. There are people that are healed today that wouldn't be healed. There's a little girl that can see who wouldn't be able to see. There are people that wouldn't have clean water to drink today. That's our friend, Pastor Mike Brown in Nakuru, Kenya. We rebuilt his church and his orphanage after Muslims burned it down. And you know what? He has a sewing program in his building, in the building we built. He teaches a couple hundred Muslim women how to sew, and they bring their children with them while they're in sewing class. And while the women are learning a trade, their children are out back behind the church singing songs about Jesus and learning about the Savior who sets the captives free. That happened because we built phase one. We rebuilt the World Prayer Tabernacle in Chalmette, Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina knocked it down. We've done dozens of, of medical clinics in Africa. We've done water projects in Kenya. We've put dozens of students through the School of Acts in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. We're doing water projects in Bangladesh. The group's leaving today. The budget is $30,000. And by the way, everybody that you saw up here, they are paying their own freight to go to Bangladesh their own money uh, out of their own savings, their own air ticket, their own lodging expenses. And believe me, they're not staying at the Hilton over there, but they're covering all their own expenses. The $30,000 is the work budget that we're putting into the ministry there. Uh, we've raised $25,000 out of that $30,000 so far. $10 will buy a blanket and a Bible for a new believer. There's going to be buckets in a tent uh, right out by the back door. And I hope if you haven't given to Bangladesh that before you leave, you'll put a 10 spot or a 20 spot or a something else spot in the bucket to help us uh, make that budget. Have you seen the new $100 bills? They're ugly. Give them away. Just put them in the bucket and, and, and bless somebody in Bangladesh. Trinidad, Appalachia, Maasai Crusades, women's conferences in Ukraine and Poland, homes for orphans that we've built, more than a dozen homes for orphans where they've created families. They took a widow and they've put her with seven or eight children and created a new family. And we've built at least 12, I think it's 15 homes for those orphans in Kampala, Uganda. None of that would have happened if we hadn't built phase one. Church multiplication, 
There are two daughter churches and now there are four granddaughter churches of harvest time that wouldn't be here if we hadn't built phase one. Iglesia Tiempo de Cosecha here in Greenwich. By the way, for you gringos, that's harvest time church in Spanish. <laughs> wouldn't be here if we hadn't built phase one doing four services every weekend. Iglesia Tiempo de Cosecha wouldn't be in Norwalk doing four services every weekend. They need to go to another Sunday morning service because the people are standing all around the walls on Sunday morning. And then I found out two weeks ago that Pastor Melanie has planted three more Harvest Time churches in South America that I didn't even know existed. This is Iglesia Tiempo de Cosecha in Bolivia. Iglesia Tiempo de Cosecha in Argentina and Iglesia Tiempo de Cosecha in Costa Rica. None of those would be there if we hadn't built phase one. If we hadn't built phase one, there would be no Harvest Time Church Stanford. There would be no Brazilian fellowship here. There would be no Filipino fellowship here. Evangelism and discipleship. If we hadn't built phase one, over 4,500 people wouldn't have attended Good Friday services in the last couple of years. 500 people wouldn't have taken the Alpha course. Over 500 people wouldn't have taken Cleansing Streams. Over 350 people wouldn't have taken Equip. Over 200 people wouldn't have taken Fresh Look. Over 420 people wouldn't have become new members of our church. If we hadn't built Phase 1, 40 Days of Purpose would have never happened. The Tommy Zito meetings would have never happened. The Greenwich outpouring would have never happened. Over 1,500 kids wouldn't have attended VBS over the last 10 years. If we hadn't built phase one, over 350 people wouldn't have been water baptized in the last 10 years. Half of all the water baptisms that we've done have happened in the last year since the Greenwich outpouring. How about receiving and reconnecting with Jesus? We hadn't built phase one. There are people who know Jesus today who might not know him. There are people who have reconnected with Jesus today who have, might not have reconnected with him. There are people who love church today who were disenfranchised from the church before. Here are some of the beautiful people that have discovered or rediscovered Jesus here at Harvest Time Church. Just flip right through those. Look at those beautiful faces. These are people who know Jesus because we built phase one. Come on, would you give God glory as you look at their faces? If we hadn't built phase one, there are many life transformations that would never have happened. Our newest ministry is called Pathways. It's a 12-step Christian recovery ministry. And our friends at Pathways wanted to show you their stories and what happened because we built phase one. Take a look at the screens. Come on, stand on your feet and let's give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise. Come on, he sets captives free. He relieves the poor. He rescues the bruised. He restores sight to the blind. Hallelujah. Beloved, I want to tell you that phase two is about so much more than a building. It's about God's mission. What stories are waiting to be written if we build our new building? There's a card in your bulletin. We want you to write your family name on it, and we want you to go out to the tent and we want you to hand it in and in exchange, you're gonna receive a package of information that tells you more about our new building and our campaign. There's a CD in there from my friend Ken Gott, awesome sermon he preached here about how God doesn't measure, he pours. So the reason we want you to turn this in is because not everybody could make it to church this weekend and those who weren't here, we wanna mail the packet out, but we're cheap. We don't wanna mail it to everybody. So we wanna know that you got yours so that we can save a little postage and just mail it out to the people that, that weren't here. So help us out with that. And then Kimmy, Pastor Kimmy got really greedy and she asked you for all kinds of information because she wants to update our database while we're doing it. So if you would fill that out and take it to the tent immediately after after the service. In a couple of weeks, you're going to receive a commitment card. And we're going to ask you to pray 
and ask God what you should give over the next three years to help us to build our new church. This is giving that is over and above your tithes. It's in addition to your missions giving. And it's a sacrifice. And we're asking you just to ask God what the number should be on your card. I want you to wear your orange bracelet and listen, just pray. Just wear it as a reminder to pray. And you know, maybe somebody will say, hey, what's that orange bracelet you're wearing? You can say, my church is building a new building. Write a big check and help us out. But I want you to pray. And I want to tell you, we're praying every day over you that God opens the windows of heaven and pours out so much blessing on you that you just have to give some away to help us build phase two. Come on, let's just sing together. Jesus, be the center of my life. And we're going to just go in one mo moment. Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. And Jesus, be the center of my life. Oh. Come on, bow your heads all over this place going to pray and we're going to go in just one minute but just before we do I was telling you a little earlier that God's mission is to share a message of good news that brings an immediate reward his message his mission is to bring a message that brings a now moment of salvation Maybe while I was talking about how God relieves the poor and how he rescues the bruised, how he releases the captives, how he restores sight to the blind. Maybe while I was sharing that, there was something in your heart that just said, I need that. I need God to do that for me. I need that now moment of salvation. I need that liberty that gets me off the treadmill of trading one dependency for another and to experience that true liberty of Jesus. Can I tell you in the services that we had before this one, we already had over 40 people this weekend that said, I need that liberation from Jesus. I wonder while heads are bowed in this place, if there's someone here and you say, I need that now moment of salvation, I I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And when I do, the kingdom of heaven is going to invade your life. The power of God is going to come. That washing of the blood of Jesus that changes everything is going to come to your life. If you're here this morning and you'd simply say, I need what Jesus came to bring and I need it now, I need it today. I want to lead you in a prayer to receive it. And I want you to just lift your hand up real high, wherever you are. You say, I want to receive that. Oh, man, there's hands everywhere. I can't even count. Come on. I need that. I want to receive that. Lift up your hand high. I want to receive that. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, someone else. I want to receive that. I need that. Come on, I want everybody all over this place. Lift up your hands with me. We're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to lead, and I want to invite everybody to follow with me this morning. If, if you've said this prayer with me many times already, it feels good to say it every time. And let's pray and ask that Jesus would come and do what only he can do. Come on, I'll lead you follow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You are God's suffering servant. You are the Jewish Messiah. You're the Savior of the world. You relieve the poor. You release the captives. You restore sight to the blind. You rescue the bruised. Jesus, I need that. I need, I need your salvation. I need grace without judgment. I need, grace without judgment. I need, amnesty. I need amnesty. I need forgiveness. I need, forgiveness. I need debt cancellation. I need, cancellation. I need, emancipation. I need emancipation. Jesus, Jesus. I, believe I believe you are the Son of God. Son of God. I, believe I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, and now I confess, Jesus is my Lord, in Jesus' name, 
amen. Come on, give the Lord a big praise in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, I want to invite you as soon as we dismiss to come right forward and our pastors are going to be here to meet you. We want to celebrate with you. We have something we want to give you. We just, just want to pray over you a blessing from the Lord before you leave this place today. This is going to be our benediction today. I want you to hug five people, tell them it's going to be a great week in Jesus and then go out to the tent and get your packet and have a great week in the Lord. God bless you, everyone, and the Lord be with you.